Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to our weekly COVID-19 public health update with Montgomery County Executive Mark Elridge. I'm Lorna Vigili, Hispanic Public Information Officer for Montgomery County Government, and welcome once again. Joining us today is Dr. James Bridgers, who is an acting health officer for Montgomery County, as well as Dr. Earl Stoddard, who is the Assistant Chief Administrative Officer, Sean O'Donnell with the Department of Health and Human Services, and today we have a special guest, Neta Squires, who will be speaking about talking about food security as we celebrate this week in the county. And with that, I toss it to you, Mr. County Executive. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm fine. And uh, thank you and everybody else for joining us for our weekly media briefing today. I'll start with our COVID rates. As for COVID rates this week, our test positivity is currently 1.24% and our Case rates, 43 cases per 100,000 residents. These rates are a slight uptick from where we were last week, but our CDC COVID community level currently remains in the low category. Our hospitalization rate is down to 1.9% of inpatient beds occupied by COVID-19 patients, another very low number. Uh, we are though dealing with the BA2 subvariant now it's become the dominant uh, coronavirus strain in the United States, which everybody expected it to do. Um, according to the CDC, uh, BA.2 caused between 51 and 59% of all new COVID case infections throughout the nation uh, for the week ending March 26th, and uh, up from an estimated 39% of all the new infections the week before. So you can see it's getting a foothold and beginning to spread and is certainly the dominant variant now. Hardest hit region was the Northeast where BA2 was causing more than 70% of all cases. I'm glad to hear that the Maryland Department of Health will soon begin providing statewide and local data that will better identify which variants of COVID we're seeing in our communities. And this will give us a more robust um, virtualization of where we actually are in dealing with COVID. Uh, good news today, uh, the FDA expanded emergency use authorization for a second booster. Uh, that came yesterday. The FDA announced the emergency use authorization for Pfizer, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines to allow all adults 50 and older to get in second booster shots four months after their first booster shot. The FDA also pr previously only allowed second booster shots for anyone 12 years of age or older who was severely immune deficient, starting four months after their first booster. The CDC also noted that adults who got Johnson & Johnson vaccine as their primary and first booster shots at least four months ago may now get an additional booster of Pfizer or, or um, Moderna. This is good news for the 50 plus population who remains our most vulnerable to serious illness from COVID. Currently 95% of our 65 plus vac population is fully vaccinated, but only 78% of this population has received their first booster. Uh, we have to continue to work to close this gap because uh, this is the most vulnerable age group. And it's very important that they get their first booster. And if they're, at the, if they're four months past that, that they get their second booster, which they're eligible for now. As with other updated booster recommendations, our county operating clinics are going to start offering the fourth booster uh, when we get the written guidance from the Maryland Department of Health, which I'm happy to say we got just moments ago. So we're beginning already to make plans for ramping up and accepting people coming in for the second uh, booster dose, and Dr. Bridges will have more on that when we turn to him. There are plenty of options in the community and we urge everyone eligible to please get your additional boosters. As you've, you know, as you've heard me say week after week, everyone has to remember to get their booster shots. You can see from this chart that our vaccinations have slowed to a crawl. At our peak, our HHS department administered 13,000 vaccinations a week by themselves. This week, it was only 654 doses. We have lots of people who need these vaccina vaccinations. Please come in. Spring break is right around the corner. Many of our residents are going to go on vacation and be traveling. This is an important time to get these boosters. And these vaccinations have the vaccines that you've already have have waning efficacy. If you've got 
a vaccination, like my my second shot was last September, uh, the efficacy of the vaccine is waning and it's time for me to get a second shot, that will be my third shot. Um, and it's true for many other county residents. The waning of the efficacy means basically that you can get sick and you can get sicker. Mm -hmm. And getting those booster shots prevents you uh, from getting the most uh, dangerous forms of COVID, the ones that are likely to put you in a hospital or kill you. Um, it, they really are um, preventative of worst outcomes. And it's important that people get themselves current with this. Uh, please provide your spring with a little bit of peace of mind and increase your protection. Like I said, this, this variant is going to be running through the population. And if you don't have your booster, you're just out there more likely to be susceptible to this. Uh, the chart we're showing is a COVID death rate uh, compared to the flu. Um, you know, I always hear from people, it's like, well, this is endemic. It's just like the flu. We need to start acting it's like it's like the flu. This chart kind of shows you that it's actually not like the flu. Um, if you look at influenza and pneumonia in calendar year 20, I've got 12.3 deaths from uh, influenza and 13 from pneumonia. I've got 94 um, in Montgomery County, 94.6 uh, in Montgomery County from uh, COVID-19 uh, and Maryland had 84.1 in its calendar year 21 when we were able to get you know people heavily vaccinated. The death rate is only 48. Um, and you're far less likely to die if you're vaccinated. That's the simple message here. Um, and influenza and flu are far less lethal and been less of a problem than COVID is. So it's not like the flu yet. Dr. Fauci said it'll be like the flu when it's actually like the flu. Um, but for people who are trying to oversimplify this, it's better than it was, but it is not the flu. And I would not be taking chances on this. Uh, Sean's going to go over some new death rate data today. And uh, as you can see from this chart, you know, we had a 300% reduction in the county's death rate from 2020 as compared to 2021. I want to thank Sean and their HS, HHS team for looking at this comparison between COVID and flu. And, you know, it's been too long that we've been listening to people with this message that it's just like the flu. So please take these numbers seriously. They're pretty clear this is not the flu. Um, do what you need to make sure that you're safe and take care of yourself. Um, as part of COVID second anniversary Remembrance Month, and we're concluding that now, over the past several weeks, we've been doing events and social media promotion on different themes, uh, recognizing those we lost, honoring our public health and healthcare workers, promoting our housing and rental relief efforts, and thanking our essential workers. Each week has brought back incredible memories, but also immense pride what we've accomplished thus far in confronting the ongoing crisis. I'm glad that we are concluding this Remembrance Month with Food Security Week, an issue that I have been worried about and focused on a long time before the pandemic arrived. Food Security Week highlights individuals and organizations that have provided necessities and other resources to people and family in need throughout the pandemic. Um, I just, just wanna express my gratitude right at the top of this for the people who have provided food in Montgomery County. When you think when COVID first hit and we were shutting everything down and the restaurants were closing and we were all trying to figure out uh, how do we deal with COVID? One of the consequences of all this was real disruptions in the food supplies and also lots of people losing their job and not having the incomes to buy food. Um, this could have become a real major disaster but thanks to the residents of this county, thanks to uh, the nonprofits and, and some of the for-profits, like the rest, one of the restaurants we're gonna talk about shortly, uh, we managed to minimize the insecurity that people would have about food. We put out, I think it was 41 million pounds of food and something like 27 million meals uh, during all of this. And that's rather remarkable output. Wouldn't have been possible without our partners 
and with people without the folks in this community who donated food and money to our partners along with what we provided in order to make them as successful as they were. Um, first place we visited yesterday was La Via in Gaithersburg and it's uh, uh, owned by Edwin Arbiza and uh, I had a chance to meet with him and his staff and they stepped up to provide thousands of meals to the community. And we had a round table discussion there with people involved in our food security uh, network. Um, after that, we went over to Yad Yehuda's Choice Pantry, which specializes in providing kosher meals. Um, the amount of food they distributed increased by 450% during the pandemic. Uh, not only are they a, a pantry for food, but they also have clothing for people in need of clothing, men's and women's clothing. And uh, they really, you know, work to serve the community and make sure they provide support to people who need it. And finally, we went on to the Silver Spring Christian Reformed Church and to their pantry, which has seen a 250% increase in demand for food from before the panic. And so you'll notice that, you know, the last two providers were providing this before the pandemic. Um, food insecurity isn't new. It wasn't invented by the pandemic. It just didn't start with the pandemic. It's been in the county. And that's one of the lessons we've taken away from this is that we need to do more on food insecurity post pandemic or even in the waning days of the pandemic because this problem is with us and it's a major problem and we need to recognize it and act accordingly and we're making investments in this budget to make sure we're better equipped to deal with food insecurity as we go forward. Uh, these two food pantries, pantries are among the over 100 food assistance providers in our county that stepped up to the plate. Many of the providers uh, are on a volunteer basis. Um, there's no way the county could have done this without the food assistance providers stepping up to the plate. Um, so we were dealing with the surge. Um, people are still seeing the, the people we were at yesterday talked about increasing numbers in the last couple of weeks of people coming in for food. So we realize that we've got to continue to do more and we are going to do that. We also created a, um, an office of food system resilience. And I'm also recommending enhanced grants for food uh, assistance programs, uh, 4 million to start within the budget to provide food directly to individuals. And today I'm glad that we're being joined by Meta Squires from our Office of Emergency Management who's been leading our food security efforts to provide some background um, an overview of our efforts as well. And uh, she'll take any questions you might have. Uh, next, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Annapolis before I turn it over to Sean and Earl. Uh, we've had some real progress in Annapolis as the session is wrapping up. Uh, the Capital Budget Subcommittee of the Maryland House appropriated last week uh, new and additional funding for projects throughout the state and Montgomery County. And the funds together with funds previously allocated from the Maryland Senate assure the key Montgomery County projects will be able to make significant progress this upcoming year. Uh, we got $30 million um, for the county's bus rapid transit system that goes to the other $30 million we got um, a week earlier. And so we've got $61 million that came from the uh, state legislature, our um, delegates and senators um, to make sure we can keep these projects moving forward. We got $11 million, bringing the total state investment to $17 million for the county's new restoration center. This is gonna be a place where we can take people um, who are on the street and in crisis, and instead of putting them in jail, we can put them in a restoration center, which is far more appropriate. We have $6.8 million for the county's uh, zero emissions bus program. We have $6 million um, that would make a total of $12 million for the massive cost overrun at the Bethesda Metro South entrance. Uh, we've got $6 million for two new bike trails for a total of $7.5 million. We've got increased funding for White Flint North Bethesda station entrance. And that brings our pre-authorized amount to about 4.5 million and $2.6 million for parks, which brings the total for parks and recreation and land preservation in the county to $33 million. Uh, we increased funding for the new Catherine and Isaiah Leggett Math and Science Building at Montgomery College's Tacoma Park Silver Spring Campus. 
These projects are all critical components of the economic development strategies we support. And uh, they're part of the county's plans to encourage future growth and sustainability, community equity, and ed educational opportunities. Most importantly, each of these projects will help enhance the quality of life in Montgomery County for all of our residents and businesses. Uh, we appreciate the hard work of the entire Montgomery County House delegation during this year's General Assembly, as well as the Senate delegation. You've been real champions for us, and uh, I want to thank you on a successful year. I'm really grateful to Mark Corman, who's the chair of the House delegation and chair of the House Appropriations and Transportation and Environment Subcommittee, and House Majority Leader Eric Ludke for working with us to ensure the county's needs were met. I'm very pleased to announce that General Assembly passed legislation yesterday to ban ghost guns. I'm grateful for the leadership of the state attorney, um, Attorney General Brian Frosch, Senator Susan Lee, and Delegate Leslie Lopez to get this bill over the finish line. Um, in Montgomery County alone, five ghost guns have been recovered from county schools, more from the public just in this year. And the ghost gun was the one that was used in the shooting at Magruder High School. Ghost guns are a problem throughout the state, and it does not make sense how we can allow guns that can't be traced to be obtained in the mail and are simple enough for even a child to put together. And I hope Governor Hogan will not veto this legislation and ensure its passage. Just so everybody understands how insane the legislation on guns are, if you wanted to order, a, say, a Glock, and you wanted to buy a full assembled, ready to use Glock, you have to have a permit and you have to purchase it from a licensed gun dealer. Even if you order it online, it has to be sent to a licensed gun dealer who verifies that you're authorized to uh, purchase and own a handgun. Ghost guns are basically the same gun disassembled with full instructions and often videos online on how to put the gun together. And if you buy it as a kit, you can have it sent to your house. No license, no permit, no nothing, and in many cases, no serial number, so the gun can't be traced. Um, this is ludicrous. Uh, they give the lame excuses, this is for hobbyists. If, if, if it's for a hobbyist, that's great. They still shouldn't have a problem registering a license, uh, registering a gun and having it licensed properly, even if they're a hobbyist. And of course, this is being used by a lot more than hobbyists. There are people who make a living out of buying multiple ghost guns and selling them on the street to a bunch of hoodlums. And uh, this is not good, and we need to put a stop to it. And like I said, I hope Governor will sign this bill. Uh, with all the negative attention that came to the Oscar ceremony this week, there was some local good news. Gaithersburg native and Quince Orchard graduate Jared Bush won an Oscar for the Best Animated Film as the writer and director for the film Encanto. I wanna congratulate Mr. Bush and I hope his accomplishment serves as an inspiration for our MCPS students and all of our county residents who work in the film and arts industries. Finally, we conclude March and as we conclude March, we're also concluding Women's History Month. And I just wanna take a moment to publicly express my gratitude toward all the women who I get to work with every day in this office and throughout the county government and for their service to our residents. The action and decisions of this county government write the history of Montgomery County. Now more than ever before, this history is being written by incredible women. Thank you. And I'm now gonna turn this over to Sean O'Donnell, Dr. Stoddard and Nita Squires before taking your questions. And what's gonna be the order? Is it you, Nita? I think so. Okay, go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to join you today in honor of uh, Food Security Appreciation Week. Um, and thank you, Mr. County Executive, for joining us on our tour yesterday um, and for your appreciation remarks. I know it meant a lot to providers to have you there in person. Um, we all probably have our own story of where we were and what we heard uh, when the news came about the mandatory stay home orders that the County Executive talked about. Uh, first thoughts that went through our heads when uh, we thought, what did this mean for our children? What did it mean for any elderly parents we have or for our jobs? 
Montgomery County is not generally viewed as a place you associate with the words food insecurity, but the reality is that for many residents, that is exactly what a shutdown meant. And more specifically for the 60,000 residents that were already experiencing hunger pre-pandemic, this meant that an exacerbation of their circumstances and sadly very quickly um, by 2021, Feeding America projected an overall food insecurity rate in Montgomery County of 11%, which given the large size of our population um, in the county equates to over 100,000 residents. Um, and this obviously caused many people to experience food insecurity for the first time. Now recall that this is in a time where supply chains proved to be brittle, which plunged the world into a global food crisis and many support systems such as adult daycares, childcare providers and school systems where people usually rely on getting their food uh, were closed. So as the county executive noted, in response, the county developed the Food Security Task Force, which was set up as a unified command model. It is a partnership between the Office of Emergency Management, the Department of Health and Human Services, and the Montgomery County Food Council, who represented the nonprofit sector um, and all the food assistance providers. The county recognized at that time that our nonprofit providers became our county's most important and impactful asset and the pre-existing tentacles that they had in the community were critical at a time when traditional mechanisms of engagement with the public had been hindered. Um, they shared the same drive, compassion, and values of human life as the administration has for our residents, which became the pillar of our success as a community to overcome the pandemic. Our partnerships emphasized supporting our providers in the way that they needed while harnessing the strength the government brings to the table. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the Food Security Task Force has helped over 110 food assistance providers through the creation of grants, investments in key programs, and bulk food purchasing. Um, the Food Security Task Force's mission was to provide more food to more people. So more food was in the form of prepared meals, uh, contracted from local sources, shelf-stable food and pantry items purchased through um, and distributed through our food bank network and fresh food uh, from local sources like county farms and local wholesalers. Um, in addition to also increasing benefit access to existing programs. So for example, the Food Security Task Force invested over five and a half million dollars in our local food banks, uh, like Capillary Food Bank and MANA. Uh, and that helped them purchase food, which enabled 46 food assistance provider to acquire free um, free food um, and about 7 million pounds of it and distributed to county residents. Similarly, the Food Security Task Force also invested over 13 million pound, uh, dollars in purchasing food from local wholesalers to supplement the need of food assistance providers um, and allow them to receive uh, fresh produce and shelf-stable food this week. And then through these investments, food assistance providers have distributed over 41 million pounds of food and over 27 million uh, uh, prepared meals to the county's most vulnerable populations. The Food Security Task Force in collaboration with Food for Montgomery, our philanthropic arm, have also given upwards of $3.6 million in grants to food assistance to the network. Um, through food access grants, farm to food bank grants, capacity building grants, resiliency grants, and community gardening grants. The task force tried to reach more people by leveraging modern technology to link residents with assistance, um, with food assistance providers and existing programs. So for example, uh, individuals facing insecurity were able to call and still are uh, 311 and be referred to the food access call center to receive information in their native language about food and over 15,000 residents service. The county also created the service consolidation hubs to, so communities can be met in their respective neighborhoods with a host of services that they need because as we all know, food is a gateway to other services. If you need food, you likely need a host of other um, assistance. From an emergency management perspective, it's said that post-disaster is the best time to initiate mitigation efforts. And given that food insecurity preceded the pandemic and will outlast the pandemic, it is important that we harness this progress that we've made uh, for the past two years and invested in long-term sustainable solutions that build community resilience. 
food is at the heart of any resiliency plan. And so therefore we are grateful to the county executive that he has recommended to create this office dedicated to food systems resilience in his new budget um, so that we can continue to develop the sustainable systems that will support short and long-term food access needs. Um, these will also strategically allocate sources to close gaps in services for specific populations and demographic locations. For example, yesterday we saw an example of a uh, choice pantry at Yadi Huda Kosher Food Pantry. Um, and choice pantries allow individuals to walk into a grocery store like pantry and um, choose the kind of food that they like for their family with the allergies and what their kids' preferences are. It allows them dignity. Um, and and empowers them um, to feel like they are just like any other member of the community. Um, it also will allow to build equity in our local food system and our economy and support small and Montgomery County owned businesses and our local farmers. Um, and then finally, um, it will also help maximize federal dollars invested in our Montgomery County food. So in closing, just on behalf of the task force, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the tremendous work done by all of our food security network, our food assistance providers, faith-based organizations, coordinating and advocacy partners, local businesses, our farmers, our donors, and both the legislative and executive branches who have and continue to support these efforts um, on an ongoing basis. Thank you, Ms. Choir. I believe it is your turn, perhaps, Mr. O'Donnell. Thank you very much. Um, I am just queuing up the slides that jumped on me. So give me one second, please. Um, I do want to, to also add that our, our colleague, uh, Netta Squires, not only has done a phenomenal around the clock work with all of the food service providers helping to coordinate um, the efforts they do. She's been a tremendous partner to our public health response. Um, she coordinated uh, all of the priority um, groups that were composed of the, uh, the essential workers in Montgomery County who are at greater risk because of their occupations. She helped coordinate with all of those different employment groups identifying the individuals, communicating with them and helping us schedule appointments. Um, just uh, tens of thousands of individuals who've been on the front lines um, for the past few years and she helped us get them vaccinated quickly um, and at a higher rate than um, we could have otherwise. So truly appreciate all of her assistance. She's also helped us uh, distribute PPE and tests out through the food service providers um, uh, to the, again, our population score at the greatest need. So really appreciate everything that she's done um, uh, during the past few years and continues to do. The, uh, like to share now um, our updated Pulse report and we'll go through a, a few of the additional points that um, uh, give us a better idea of what we're seeing now. Um, as the county executive uh, shared with you all, we are continuing to see uh, lower hospitalization rates um, and um, some uh, modest leveling of our, our tested, our case rates based on PCR testing um, and, and a, a very modest increase there. Uh, looking at our hospitalization rates, taking a, a slightly uh, deeper dive at our Montgomery County hospitals, we only have, uh, as of yesterday, only have five patients who uh, have a COVID uh, diagnosis, five acute care patients, uh, zero ICU patients, um, and seven of the last 14 days, we've had no ICU patients in our hospitals. The Washington and Venice alternate care site uh, has the other 10 patients in our county, and two of those are ICU patients. So again, this, again, represents a um, some of our lowest levels of, of severe illness due to COVID in our county. And we, we hope to continue to see that, um, that remain low. Uh, again, just highlighting um, the importance of, of being up to date on your vaccinations and being vaccinated to protect against uh, hospitalizations and death. Um, we will continue to share uh, the, the ongoing graphs of, of those numbers. Uh, one of the more recent evaluations that 
Um, we've worked with our county epidemiologists on developing, uh, was looking at the COVID-19 death rates per 100,000 at the county, the state, and the national level. And we, we share this, uh, again, just for some um, a larger perspective, uh, we've seen the county uh, death rates decrease um, from the first year uh, into the second year. And as you look at that large peak in the middle, that was, of course, last winter where um, we had some of the most significant illness in the county. It was still, we were starting to see already at that point, uh, some decrease in the death rates, even though it was still, a, there was still a phenomenal impact, um, not just in the county, but across the nation. Um, and then we saw, certainly as we went into the vaccination period, um, the county was able to, to reduce those death rates even more significantly. Um, one thing that we've been saying is it's, it is hard to avoid some of these uh, peaks that are felt in the state and in the nation uh, in the different waves of COVID. But what we, we strive to do is reduce that um, overall height of, of the number of deaths and the, uh, the, um, the total amounts of deaths and serious illness. Um, we did want to uh, get some comparison for how, how COVID has affected us uh, at different points in time. And um, we, uh, in the in the fu near future, we will also have our updated influenza and pneumonia numbers um, based on the last uh, a few years. Um, you know, we already have this, the state rates. Um, traditionally, the the CDC and the National Center for Health Statistics do combine influenza and pneumonia um, uh, because they are they are very much linked uh, as diseases, uh, as progressions of diseases. But influenza alone tends to be a much smaller rate where, where pneumonia deaths make up um, uh, a larger number of, of those rates. But we, we do have a ways to go, even with that improvement from the first year, the first count, the first 12 months of COVID to the second 12 months of COVID, now that we're, we're through uh, a greater period than that, um, we have seen an improvement. Uh, we'd like to maintain, we'd like to improve upon that further um, but our concern is that it does take individuals uh, continuing to be up to date on their vaccinations as immunity wanes. The, the CDC's updated their um, uh, the their week to week uh, assessment of the variant proportions, as has been mentioned. Um, in our region, we're now um, estimated to be over 50% um, in across the country. It is approximately 55% of the uh, sampled uh, COVID cases are um, being identified as the BA2 variant. Uh, so we'll continue to track that, um, but we have not seen significant increases in our country um, in the total number of cases. As we look at the, uh, the WHO monitoring globally, um, we have seen over the last few weeks a, a modest second bump um, and some of that is being uh, driven in Europe as well as Western Pacific. We continue to monitor that. Um, we've seen in the past that the European data has been um, a better indicator of, of what we are likely to see in the United States. Um, and we've seen over the last few weeks, again, they've had a modest increase uh, that's being driven by uh, some specific increases in some countries, some decreases in other countries. So again, it's something we're paying close attention to, uh, to, to get an idea of, of whether we will, again, see some sort of, of bump related to BA2. Uh, just the, the, the latest breaking is, um, since we began this press conference, we did get a, uh, an update from our state partners that uh, the state has now authorized us to give second uh, boosters out to the indicated um, those individuals who are 50 years of age and older and those who are 12 and older um, who are immunocompromised. Um, our teams are saying that they are prepared to do that at the county clinics. Um, I imagine many of the uh, private sector are, are prepared to do that as well. Um, one thing I would caution and recommend to the public is um, there's likely to be an increased uh, uh, short-term demand based on this eligibility um, and, and to try to, when 
before going to a site to try to see if there's appointments. We will, of course, try to accommodate walk-ins at the county sites to the extent that we have a vaccine on hand at the site and we have um, enough for the uh, the appointments that have already been made. Um, we'll, we'll look to try to increase some of those appointments in the coming days. Um, but again, there's lots of opportunities uh, throughout the community to get vaccinations and there's very rarely uh, lines to do so. Um, again, we just want to echo the remarks by uh, Dr. Marks. That is not just important to get a second booster if, you, if it's been four months um, uh, since your first booster and you're in one of those higher risk groups. But having that initial booster is still very important and there's still lots of people who have not um, taken advantage of that. We do know that immunity wanes over time and of course uh, the booster is an important thing to get. Uh, there's one other thing I want to add. We um, just participated in um, uh, communication with our federal partners. They've just un unveiled today a new federal website, covid.gov, uh, that is um, compiling together uh, uh, links to lots of resources and that, and that drills down to locally available resources as well. So it covers everything from where to get masks, where to get uh, treatment vaccines or even testing. Um, one of the key things that has been brought up recently is uh, with increased availability of antivirals for COVID, uh, where can people go to get treatment for that? Um, there is a, a, a treatment finder now through that, and we will, of course, link to that from the county's webpage. Um, but you can find, I just did a very quick search, 10 miles around the Rockville area, and there were 11 facilities, um, pharmacies or medical offices, where you can be tested uh, with a rapid test and um, based on the result of that, uh, potentially receive antiviral treatment um, during that visit. Uh, there's another 36 places that are identified that with a prescription from your provider, you can also receive antivirals. So there are increasing opportunities through the county uh, to get treated for a COVID infection. And we encourage people to, to look up these resources and use these resources. Uh, just a very brief update on our vaccination levels. Um, we're continuing to vaccinate all ages. Uh, we're now at 57% of the fully vaccinated 12 and older population having availed themselves of a, a booster dose. Um, currently, this is data on uh, both those immunocompromised with an additional third dose or, um, or anybody else with a booster dose. Um, certainly, these we expect these uh, uh, the tracking to have to shift a little bit as there's now a second booster dose. Um, wh who is getting those additional doses? Who is getting those booster doses? Well, we continue to, to strongly, strongly recommend, of course, those people at the greatest risk, the immunocompromised, those over 65 plus. Um, we're seeing across the board, uh, the increases of those receiving boosters has gone up about three to 4%. Um, basically across the board over the last month, which is not a rapid increase, but it is a, a, a steady increase. Uh, we hope with the, the most recent guidance, of course, it will um, drive home the importance of getting a booster. And again, just to remind folks that uh, if they need testing, we are still handing out rapid tests and um, N95 and KN95 masks through the county's libraries. Um, we're also, we have a pickup and drop off uh, PCR service at a number of our rec centers. Um, those results come back approximately 24 hours later for the PCR test. So if you, if you do need a, a higher sensitivity test, um, please feel free to stop by and, and pick up one of those. Um, just be reminded, you, you still need to conduct the test and drop it off. Um, and, and register online that you've done it in order to get your results. But um, we continue to have that testing, those multiple testing um, uh, availability, as well as in-person PCR testing at county sites and, of course, at private sites. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Stoddard for any additional comments. I've got no opening comments today. I don't know if Dr. Bridgers has any or we proceed to questions. None from me either. We can proceed to questions. So, Lorna, back to you. 
All right, thank you, gentlemen. Let's get started with the Q&A portion of this presentation. Kate Ryan, WTOP. Good afternoon, Kate. And we do have a cutoff at about 1.30 this afternoon. Got it. Kate? Thank you very much. I just wanted to uh, check in with the county executive on the SRO situation. Um, the MOU has been arrived at, according to the Washington Post, who got a copy. I don't have a copy. I asked the school system about it. Um, there is a lot of concern that this was done outside of public view. You have, you know, the school system, which gets half of the tax dollars that go in from the county's budget and the police department negotiating for something that people can't see. Um, can you talk about whether or not that's appropriate and should there have been more input directly? I, the, the school system presented this and discussed it in school, in school system meetings with the school board, which is where I would have expected it primarily to be discussed. discussed. And they weren't negotiating with the police. I think they were coming to terms with what they wanted that program to look like and then simply working with the police for whatever changes there are. This isn't a negotiation where the police, police have one side and they wanna do one thing and the school system's trying to do something different. This is driven by the school's determination of what they think is the right response um, given the situation we find ourselves in. And, and the police just happen to be the partner, but this isn't a negotiation. I think that's a mischaracterization of what actually happens in this process, but they did share it you know, publicly on the school board. I know the councils had this shared with them. Um, I've gotten a copy of it. Uh, I had you know, some early comments that I asked them to make sure that things aligned, that the message in the letter was the same as the, lesson, less the message in the actual guidance. Um, I will say that it's very little different from what has been what had been originally approved, and you know, Dr. Starter could talk a little bit more about that. But you know, the the essence of it is that um, the big change is that in the morning, lunchtime, and at closing time, officer will be in a room in the school. They are still not patrolling the halls, period, and they are not enforcing school discipline which is how this whole thing got drastically and so radically off track in the first place when the officers were used uh, to enforce school discipline, which is not what anybody had intended. Um, we say, you know, when I was on the council, we certainly never talked about it that way. Um, as little as a fan as I was of this program, it was not meant to be a school discipline program, but it wound up being used that way. And that's most unfortunate. Um, but they cannot um, go in, they cannot and are not going to be present for internal discipline discussions with the student. They will not be enforcing internal discipline at all. It is only, they only get involved if they're called out of, from where they are to deal with something that's truly criminal, criminal, homicide, rape, other sexual assault, and weapons. That's it. This is not, you know, an opportunity for them to be around the school fishing for information. I think the school system felt, um, and you'll have to ask them, you know, to clarify, but, you know, my sense is they felt that given the fact they weren't able to implement what we had both hoped we'd do, which is put the social workers in the schools. And, you know, Dr. McKnight had come out with a very aggressive two per school, 50 social workers, more even than we had talked about at the county level. And when they went to go hiring those people, um, they were not able to hire them. So the social workers were supposed to be the replacement for the SROs. So unable to hire the social workers, I'd say it's safe to say that what they did was revert to a modified program that accomplished the main things that we were all trying to accomplish, which is not have the officers enforcing discipline and not having the officers patrolling the halls. And I think that's what they've been able to accomplish with this. And there's a whole lot of other stuff that Dr. McKnight has in terms of restorative justice that isn't part of the, um, the SRO CEO issue, but is a part of it. How do you deal with students' um, uh, mental health concerns and how do you provide them with the supports they need? And she has a, a good view and I think decent program for where she wants to go with that. And that doesn't involve SROs or CEOs either. 
Right. My question, though, was more about the MOU process. It is, you, you say it's not negotiation, but it is a formal agreement. And what the school board uh, put up at its um, meetings were uh, a sort of a PDF of what they said were MOU highlights. But when asked for the document, we were told, quote, it's not being shared at this time. A police department did not share it either. So again, do you have concerns that a, a very important public document was not able to be examined by the public? Well, it's it's not implemented yet either. Let's keep that in mind. And so it's not at the final stage. I got a I got a transmission to me saying they were you know looking for count. I think it was council and county executive approval. Um, they did have a diverse group of people involved in the process. I mean, Earl, do you want to talk a little bit about what you know of, of this? Yeah, so I mean, they've obviously had a, a, a group of students, uh, school administrators, teachers, uh, I believe some parents of, of students uh, that's been working on basically the CEO model, the restorative justice work, as well as sort of the mental behavioral social support help all together that's been meeting monthly uh, on this issue since, yeah, obviously before the 2021 version was implemented. And as I recall from the from last year's version, what ended up happening with the 2021 version as well is there were meetings with all these groups and then the police department and, and uh, school system took the feedback that they received during those meetings and incorporated it into an MOU. And once the MOU got through the legal review process and was signed, it was shared publicly. Uh, there was not like this redlining that was going on in the public space of, of the MOU because they had done the meetings leading up to that just as they did in this situation to get the public feedback on what should go into the MOU. But then there wasn't like, you know, there wasn't this um, global editing of a document where everyone was providing, oh, no, you should change this word to this word. And no, I don't agree with that. Um, you know, obviously it's, it's once you get to the agreement stage, um, they've just got to get, you know, similar language down. But, you know, to, to say that there wasn't public input, I mean, the county executive met with Racial Justice Now, Silver Spring Justice Coalition, the Pro uh, Students for Progress, I believe, or Mark, I don't know what the, I'm yeah. sorry, I don't know what the name of that group was, but uh, uh, we've met with multiple um, advocate groups on this, on this specific issue since the discussion that was had with the uh, school board. Uh, the county executive has encouraged the, the superintendent to meet with the same groups at their request. And so obviously there has been public engagement, but the thing about this situation that's a little bit different than last summer, number one, is that um, we're in the middle of the school year. So obviously trying to make a change midstream is a little bit different than having an entire summer to walk, work things through. And number two, this change is not significantly different from the CEO one point model, certainly not nearly as big a transition as the SRO to the CEO model itself was. As the county executive alluded to, the hallmarks of what the CEO program got rid of have been maintained in this. There's just a bit more flexibility to, ad to address the serious incident issues that we've been seeing. And so, um, you know, I, I think, I mean, there has certainly been public engagement on this process. We've been talking, uh, I think the school board presentation on the highlights of what's, what's going to go into the MOU occurred six weeks ago or so, uh, maybe a little bit more than a month ago. And so there has been a significant public discourse on this, but as a, I do not believe there was any point where the MOU draft was shared in 2021 and there was this public redlining that occurred that people seem to think should be occurring with the version that is currently being discussed. Thank you. As I recall in 2021, they, the school system met with the police, but also a small group of, you know, students and teachers and came up with that first uh, proposal. So this, this is not any different than the other one. The, the, the one thing that is going to happen is, you know, they've said themselves that there's going to be monthly tracking of data. So we can see over the next two months, which is really what we're talking about here, um, how this works. And, you know, does it, does it change anything? I, we get the sense that there's already been uh, some changes in what's going on in the schools, just all in and of its own accord. There seems to be uh, fewer incidents uh, that have been problematic. And I do wanna give credit to um, the schools, school security people who've been in the schools all this time who've stepped up, if you think about it, for all those cases that used to go to the principal, they're being handled differently. They're being handled internally 
with school security staff, which is what we had hoped they were meant to do all along. So some of the good news of this is they're actually able to make better of their better use of their school security staff to deal with issues that really should be school issues and not police issues. If, if the SRO program had continued unabated, many of those incidents would have been referred to the police for discipline rather than to the school security staff. So this in itself is a sign that school security staff is capable of handling these issues, the bulk of them for sure. Thanks. Thank you, Kate. Coming up next, Lex Juarez from WDBM. Good afternoon, Lex. Hi there. I was also having some questions on this memorandum of understanding. So you said that there was public input given, you know, surrounding uh, school board meetings and, and that of the like. Do you think there's been enough public input? But I've heard from a lot of people today who have said, you know, they, they, they're not seeing that there's been enough uh, you know, time for people to really have discussions around this. We've been discussing this for over a year. This is a mid-year adjustment in the light of not being able to put in place the substitute that everybody had envisioned putting in place. I mean, I don't know what the result would be to take a months long process, which would mean not only didn't we put in place what we had tried to put in place because of the difficulty in hiring, but then we would do nothing at all except remove the SROs. I think the schools had legitimate concerns. I think they've gone about this in a thoughtful way, getting to this point, and we all know this work isn't over. We've got two months left in the school year. There's not a chance in the world they could staff all these schools with psychologists in that point, in that time point, point or uh, time frame, or social workers. Uh, I think this is a reasonable thing to do in lieu of the alternative would probably be to do nothing. And that's not what we told people we were going to do. We told people we would substitute the police for social workers. That didn't happen. You also, also have, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to add, I mean, we also have this clear uh, call from the, the superintendent saying that the school system needs some additional supports and, and the principals have been loud and clear that they need feel like they need some additional support. So when we're hearing from the school system that they believe they need some additional help, it, that, you know, it's, 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 it's a lot easier to say, well, we should just, you know, wait and not provide you the help because now, you know, if the number of serious incidents continues or, 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 um, you know, heaven forbid there was another serious incident, then, you know, we'd, you know, obviously we would get lambasted for not providing them the assistance they've requested. And so there's a, there's a balancing, we're trying, we're trying to make sure we're doing this right, but we're also doing it expeditiously to provide the school system with what they've asked for, which is some additional support and some additional ability for some flexibility in, in the different school clusters. You guys have given a little bit of an outline of what's in that memorandum of understanding as, um, you know, has already been stated, they're not sharing that with us right now because they said it's not complete. Could you give any more, any more information regarding, you know, exactly what that plan is as we're not able to look at it ourselves? Sure. So I think the, the core basis of the, the strategy is that obviously the CEOs will not be in each individual school, park in each individual school as the, as the previous SROs were. The CEOs will not be involved in student discipline. What you will see the CEOs do, being able to do more, is have some direct interaction with school administrators and school administrations. They, as the first CEO allowed and the second CEO version allowed, the second CEO version encourages is for the, uh, the CEO to have a space inside, particularly the high schools, where they can work out of. Uh, they will not be patrolling the hallways. They will be interacting with the school administration. They can be invited to school activities uh, based on the, uh, the based on the, the decision or the want of the principals. So, for example, they can do uh, school assemblies and talk about um, introduce them to the, who the CEO is, talk about uh, school safety issues there. Um, but they won't be patrolling the school hallways. They won't be involved in student discipline. They will be available to students if students want to go to them. So for example, if someone wants to go talk to the CEO, they can be made available for that, but certainly they aren't going to be going out and doing law enforcement activities in the school, except in responding to a serious incident involving criminality. Uh, you know, not, we're not talking about a, a fight between two students, but if someone 
obviously brings a ghost gun to school, for example, they'll be responding where if someone reports a uh, sexual assault in the school or at home in the school setting, the, obviously the CEO will get involved at that point. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lax. Up next, Steve Monell, Bethesda Beat. Good afternoon, Steve. Good afternoon. Um, this first question is for the county executive, and it's actually on a local issue, the Bethesda area. So there was money allocated uh, for the Norwood Park, kind of a new dog park. Um, uh, last year, I think Park and Planning approved this. And and your CIP this year, the, the funding has been removed um, to my understanding. And I'm wondering, County Executive, just what the rationale was for that. And if you have any, uh, any other vision for that space. Um, it's a park. So my, my vision for the space is that it stay a park. And the residents over there were very upset that their park was gonna become the central focus of a dog park. And there are lots of questions about the process that um, park and planning went through. And so I was more than happy to delay this because it's kind of indicative of the way park and planning has been working with minimal community input and the council concurred. So it's a happy outcome. Okay. And we'll find, and we'll find another place for the dog park because we're not saying there shouldn't be dog parks. Okay. Um, is there anything particularly concerning about that? Or are you just pretty much the community around it, you know, gave you feedback and you're like, okay, there's more against than for, if that makes sense. That's one way of looking at it. I mean, this is intensely unpopular. They feel like they're having their park basically destroyed and largely taken away from them. And there are larger places to put this. And it wasn't something that the residents there said, hey, we'd like to have a dog park here. Um, I don't know how they landed on that. They had other choices, some of them not as intrusive, but um, I don't always understand how they work, but I do understand how they work this time was enough to really agitate people in the community. And obviously council members felt the same sense of agitation. Okay. Um, the county executive, anyone can field this one, uh, that there's gonna be state and local data for variants that are coming out. Um, this could have been you know, sooner even, but I'm wondering if you've heard from the state about the timeline there, about when we might be able to see that data. I know I can ask the state myself, but figured I'd ask anyone on this call if they knew. Sure, Steve, thank you for the question. I'll respond. Um, we've been, uh, Dr. Lou has been talking to his counterparts in the state. He's our chief epidemiologist. And so we've been requesting data. Hopefully it will come this week, operative word, hopefully. Um, they are revising their dashboards. Everyone is trying to realign to um, CDC's community level reporting versus case rate transmissions. And so we hope that that will give a better snapshot based on the state call that I was on yesterday. As Mr. O'Donnell indicated, yes, the BA2 variant has slightly increased and has been incrementally increasing over the past three weeks. We haven't seen the surge and we continue to monitor the number of BA2 variant sequence in the state is still about a one to three ratio based on the data that I indic that I received yesterday based on the call. So the state is working on that now. We hopefully we hope that it will be available later this week. Because you don't have the local data, are you kind of inferring that the state rate is likely similar to what we're seeing in the county, if that makes sense? Sure, I can't give you a comparative analysis because I don't know what we're seeing. We don't get the specific data uh, uh, regarding what's sequenced in the county based on the labs. The labs are sent and sequenced through um, uh, the state's lab and Johns Hopkins. And so we don't have that, that data available. What we get is an aggregate uh, a number or percentage based on the sequencing that they do. The last question I have, I've asked kind of similar ones before is, just how severe this new strain is. I know Sean said during the presser with the council president on Monday that if you've had the original strain of Omicron, it's less likely that you'll have a breakthrough case of 2.0. Correct me, Sean, if I'm wrong there, but I'm just wondering what any of you have seen in the literature about the severity of this, how what it what how it's different than Omicron or other other variants, I guess. So we haven't we haven't seen that severity. I think Dr. Stoddard placed the article uh, shared with us an article 
from the Lancet, I think last week that talked about the severity and how those individuals who are there uh, have been affected or were infected by um, the original Omicron strain, uh, strain had some, uh, not only natural immunity, but didn't see the level of severity. And we aren't seeing that now. We are continuing to monitor that. And so I'm just not seeing it in there. We haven't seen the surge. We are expecting an uptick um, in the coming weeks, but we won't see the um, number of cases um, uh, that we saw through Omicron. And we anticipate that that's because of some of the uh, uh, effects of the um, vaccines. That's why we're pushing um, a second uh, booster now to increase uh, the response rate, the body response rate. So we just aren't seeing it, or I haven't seen it in any of the uh, data. We're also looking at the effects of uh, uh, long COVID and how that may have progressively or have an impact on individuals over time. So all of these uh, items we are researching and monitoring now. One thing, I, I, Dr. Bridges, is, I think Dr. Bridges got to a, so a key point there at the end, but I also want to highlight it. I think one thing we can infer from what we're seeing in the trends is that um, there is, you would not see BA2 taking over BA1 if there weren't a transmission uh, um, strength mm -hmm. for BA2, meaning, but you also can tell that it's not, the difference between Omicron BA1 and Delta, Omicron took over much more quickly than BA2 is taking over from Omicron, which means that the, the transmission benefit is likely lower for BA2. And it also infers that the because you're not seeing hospitalization, you're not seeing the faster takeover, that it's not likely substantially more severe than Omicron because we're not seeing it in hospitalization rates, even in places where Omicron or BA2 has taken over more heavily, in, like in the Northeast you're not seeing hospitalization rates soaring there either. And so because of the differentials you can see between different communities, it's unlikely that BA2 presents a substantial threat in the short term to healthcare systems or to people generally. Um, but obviously it's one of those things that are where we don't know the long-term impacts of COVID-19 very well. We've seen, uh, you know, changes in the rate of diabetes, changes in neurological conditions long-term, changes in circulatory uh, system issues long-term. The constellation of long COVID or COVID uh, complications seems to grow with each passing week and a better understanding of them increases as the number of people. So I think that we've got a lot to, to unpack long-term. So I, while I don't think BA2 necessarily acutely is going to be an issue, more people being infected by COVID in terms of the implications for our long-term health and health disparities is going to be something we're going to be dealing with or, or grappling with for, for, for months and years to come. No, thank you, everyone. And Earl, it sounds like you're feeling well. Uh, so good to see that, obviously. Yeah, I've, been, I've had a pretty mild case. Um, you know, obviously it's been, you know, my, you know, unfortunately one of my children did test positive yesterday. So obviously that's the bigger implication for, for families is that, you know, we have to, you know, it's, it, you make sure you're individually healthy, but also making sure that uh, you limit the spread within your, your households too. So that's the, the current challenge. But thank you for asking, Steve. Yep. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Steve. We have one last question from Rebecca Tan, Washington Post. Good afternoon, Rebecca. Hi, thank you for having me. I have two quick clarifications clarifying questions and then something a little bit more open-ended. Uh, the first one really is a yes-no question. When signed, the MOU would take effect immediately. Is that right? With it, yeah, 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 yes, yeah. Okay. I mean, they, they, they will look to effectuate it. I don't know if it's gonna go from like 1201 it's signed and at 1202 the change happens. Got it, uh, got it, yeah. And, but, and but immediately, yeah. Right, and the school system did tell us they intended to sign it this week. Um, the second clarifying question, in the RSSW subcommittee that was made, uh, that was convened last year by the RH administration, um, there was a subcommittee that was explicitly focused on the MOU, it was called the MOU subcommittee, was that not right? And did they not do a pretty granular line by line review of the MOU? I'd have to, I, I took, when I talked to Captain Flynn about this yesterday, um, because I wasn't on that subcommittee, so I don't know exactly what their work was and how it exactly looked. Um, that was not the impression I was given. We can, I can get a clarification from her because she was act, I mean, she was really actively involved, as was uh, Assistant Chief. Um, um, okay, 
yeah, I think yeah. The, the public records and documentation of that of that process as well. Um, and my third more open ended question is that um, both the county executive and you, Dr. Stoddard, have said that police will not be enforcing school discipline, a message that came out from uh, the police chief as well. Um, to, to clarify again here, they were not meant to be enforcing school discipline under the SRO program either, correct? And, and I'm going to and I'm going to quote here from the SRO MO, uh, of, of the MO, MOU that used to exist in the SRO era. SROs, you know, will not be used to enforce MCPS policy rules, regulations, procedures, and and or policies. Oh, sorry, did I cut out for that? that no, did no, I? no, I heard you. Oh, got it, got it. Yeah. So I just want to ask, you know, given that they weren't meant to be doing it under the SRO program, and they're not meant to be doing it now, but they were, you know, actually doing it under the SRO program. Who's to say it'll be different this time around? Uh, the superintendent's been really clear that there are going to be consequences if it's not done the way it's supposed to be done. Got it. So that's, she's been, that's she's the been, difference. Look, this, she's been really firm about this. And, you know, they're the ones that would have known how things were being carried out there. I think all of us were more than a little surprised at the number of cases that police were involved in, particularly when we discovered it wasn't like the police were doing this of their own accord because they thought this was criminal activity, but the overwhelming majority were initiated by administrative staff. That was not something I don't think anybody realized. And she's been very clear that she's not going to tolerate that this time. We've also been doing a lot more data collection with the CEO program than we were doing with the SRO program in, in, in large part to address what you've raised, because I think it was something where I don't know that it was ever um, malicious that they were trying to be involved in 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 student discipline. I think they just, frankly, just it, they got too comfortable working together, or they got too intimately involved in some of those things, and then it just sort of spilled over into really negative. But I will tell you that um, because we're we're more closely tracking. What, so, for example, when the CE when the CEOs are called, we actually have things go through a centralized call system much more routinely now to make sure that we're tracking what the CEOs are doing, when they're responding to things in the schools and what they're responding to. And then the report system has also changed with that so that we can collect better data. So we have a much greater handle on what the CEOs are doing in the schools than we had under the previous SRO program, in large part to prevent, because no matter what the agreement says, any CEO 1.0, CEO 2.0, we still have to make sure that whatever agreement is, is signed and, and, and agreed to is what's actually happening. And that's something where we have to hold the school system accountable and they have to hold the they have to hold our officers accountable to make sure that we're we're upholding the, the agreement. And so we're glad the superintendent is on the same page with the county executive to make sure that that you know discipline is is a no-go. We've supported increased budget asks for their uh, school security, as well as um, their asks with regard to the budget to, to help with restorative justice and uh, social service supports. And so our, our goal here is to give the school system the tools it needs to respond to student discipline that does not involve law enforcement. And so that's, that, that's sort of, you know, both what we want in this agreement, but also what is reflected in, in the budget that we've, uh, the county executive has sent over to the county council. Got it. And, and last question, very quickly. Um, Dr. Sardar, you mentioned principals, right, uh, this time around, uh, saying they need more help. Um, school principals unanimously said in December 2020 that they did not want the SRO program to go away, that they really wanted these officers to stay. Um, and yet in the spring of 2021, um, the county executive, you were willing to go against the wishes of these principals. I'm curious to know what has changed since then? Why, why are the views of principals now so important uh, when they weren't or they didn't seem to be uh, about a year ago? I can start, but thank yeah. you, you want to chime in. Uh, so a couple things have changed. Obviously, we've had a pandemic. Students have come back to the classroom in very different situations from a mental health and social health uh, perspective. And so we've seen some behaviors that we did not see pre-pandemic. So obviously, that has, has created some significant concerns within the school setting. Number two, the school system has not been able to hire the social service and mental health supports that we expected them to be able to hire. To, I know they've hired 22 of the 50 at this point. Obviously, 
I'm, we're not necessarily blaming them for that because obviously it's a lack of social workers that are available to people. But you know, with the increase in in, in serious incidents, the proliferation of ghost guns, the proliferation of uh, mental health issues, the inability to address those mental health issues through restorative justice and social service supports, it kind of left us in this position of uh, we knew that the we knew we knew that the principals needed new, more help, and they were saying that to us earlier. But we expected that help to come in the form of those other programs that the school system was setting up. Those those programs have not been set up nearly as quickly right. as we expected or the school system expected. I think that's that's the difference that you have to look look at, Rebecca. Um, we had planned on replacing the, the SROs, not abandoning them and not doing anything. And what we've been left with because of the hiring problem was that we had to do we had to do something different that we didn't expect we were going to be doing. Um, so we're well aware of the principal's concerns and without an alternative to SROs, we don't have something where we can say, well, this is the path we're on and we're going to use this instead. The instead doesn't exist right now. So you make a decision with what you've got, not with what you wish you had. And I think intrinsic in that as well, as you've said, uh, Mr. County Executive, is that once they do have those other supports in the schools, we will again reevaluate what yeah. the CEO model looks like coming out of that. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you, uh, Netta Squires for joining us today. As we close today, we would like to say farewell, goodbye to Oheni Yapon, who is, has been since 2014, the Deputy Director for the Office of Public Information the office I work out of. Thank you for your service. Uh, you're moving forward. And uh, the reason we're saying goodbye is because among other responsibilities, you've been the man running these media briefings throughout the pandemic. And the members of the media will need to know that you will no longer be assisting them with these briefings. So thank you for your service. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Uh, you'd like to say something, Mr. County Executive? Yeah, I just wanted to thank O'Henny as well. I mean, he's um, made this amazing pivot, one of the many pivots the county had to make to doing these weekly press conferences on top of everything else we do. And uh, he's really, you know, been at the center of holding this all together throughout the last two years. And I just want to tell him much I appreciate the work he did, and I wish him well in his next endeavor. Thank you, Mr. County Executive. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Farewell, my friend, and uh, stay safe. We'll see you Bye. again next week. Bye -bye. Thanks again, Annie. Mm -hmm.